So today is June 18th, 2019. We're here at Fonjim Library with Houston Asian, Asian American Archive. My name is Mary Claire Neal. My name is May Lee Braun. And we're interviewing um, Mr. Leroy Chow. Okay, so can you just start off by telling us when and where you were born and how your family ended up in Danville, California? Sure, I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1960. My parents had both immigrated to the U.S. Uh, originally both were born in China in Sangdong province and uh, they uh, both ended up in Taiwan after the war, met each other uh, at university there. And then by the time I was born, they had immigrated to the U.S. So we uh, progressively moved westward, uh, lived for a while in, in Wichita, Kansas, and then uh, from the age of seven, uh, pretty much grew up in California, out in the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. Do you have brothers and sisters? Or I have two sisters, one older, one younger. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Do you have any early childhood memories from either Milwaukee or Danville? Uh, yes, actually. Uh, so, you know, I have a few memories of, of being in Milwaukee and then even Wichita. And then, uh, of course, growing up in California, I have a lot of memories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what were some of your favorite teachers or subjects like well, really early on as a kid? Yeah, no, I remember in first grade, Miss Link, I had a big crush on my first grade teacher. <laughs> and uh, it was a big thrill because we got to invite her over to our house for dinner. And I oh. thought that was a pretty neat thing. And, and I asked for and received uh, one of her class, you know, the, the photos that we got at school. And they also took photos of the teachers. So she gave me one of her photos that I put in my photo album. Wow. <laughs> Is that something you did, like, as a tradition with your teachers? No, no, no. No, she was just, uh, I don't know why, but uh, I had a big crush on her in wow. first grade. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, so what kind of values or beliefs were you raised with as a child, whether through your school or your parents mm -hmm. or your community at large? Yeah, so my parents were very much Chinese, of course. They came from China came from, and immigrated to Taiwan, went to Taiwan, they immigrated to the U.S. Uh, but they also thought it was important that we, their children, assimilate into the American mainstream. So... Uh, so we kind of grew up with one foot in each culture. And so, you know, the Chinese values that were instilled were, of course, uh, you know, integrity, honesty, hard work, uh, doing well in school and making something of yourself, you know. And then uh, kind of the the uh, the nice blend with the American culture. A lot of them overlap, like the honesty and the integrity, but also, uh, you know, being creative and thinking outside the box and taking risks, things like that. So did you kind of, did that make sense to you or did you ever challenge any of those values as you did? Uh, no, I wouldn't say I really challenged them, you know. Uh my parents wanted us to speak Chinese, and so we did speak Chinese at home. <clears throat> Although, uh, as I'm finding with my own kids, they, they really don't want to speak Chinese at home. I really don't didn't want to either. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, my parents, it was important. They used to find us, you know, five cents, ten cents for speaking English at home. Uh, but uh, so I guess in the way, it was kind of challenging them that way. But uh, otherwise, you know, I saw the value in in what they were saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, let's see. Um, so, who were some of your best friends growing up? Uh, so I remember some good friends when I was very young, you know, uh, uh, some people in Wichita. I mean, when I left, we left Wisconsin when I was three, so I really didn't have any friends there. Uh, but uh, by the time I was, you know, five or six years old, I had some friends uh, in the neighborhood growing up. So I remember a, a guy named uh, Morgan, uh, you know, that went to school with me and a guy that went, lived across the street, Lance, you know, I remember him. Uh, of course, don't really keep in touch with it anymore. But, uh, but actually, after I moved to California, I had some have some friends that I do still keep in touch with from, you know, age of seven, eight, kind of thing. Wow. Um, so, what did you imagine yourself being in the future? I, I think you were probably eight years old when mm -hmm. Apollo Eleven happened. Yes, Before right. That, did you have any? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I was uh, always liked technical things. I liked building things and taking things apart. So uh, engineering was kind of the way I was steered, and, and it was a natural fit for me. Uh, but, uh, yeah, when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, I'd always been interested in airplanes and rockets. But after, after watching Apollo 11 land on the moon, then that's when the dream for, of becoming an astronaut started for me. Did you talk to your family about that? Or your I did, friends? yeah, or? yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, of course, a lot of all the young people back then, most young people wanted to be astronauts, didn't that? during that period of time, but most, but I kind of took it seriously. It was always in the back of my mind. And I think my, my parents probably thought it was kind of cute that I wanted to be an astronaut, but they didn't really think it was a serious mm -hmm. ambition. <laughs> Did they change <clears throat> their view on that over time, or...? Uh, not really. They thought it was important that I become an engineer, which was kind of a prerequisite or at least a technical, you know, science or technology, some kind of a science or technology degree. So they were happy that that was driving me towards 
uh, getting an engineering degree. But then, um, you know, even after I applied to NASA, they thought, oh, well, that's nice, you know. And, <laughs> and uh, I don't think they actually believed I would get in, you know. <laughs> and then after I did, of course, they were they were happy about it. But uh, my dad even, you know, being Chinese, kind of pulled me aside and said, okay, well, I'm going to do this for a few years. Then, you know, come back and do a real job, you know, and go, go back to engineering, you know. <laughs> Did you have any, <clears throat> any especially important role models or even like music or books that really got your attention? Going? Well, you know, I, so I was, you know, pretty much the, the, the nerd kid that uh, was interested in, as I said, science and technology and things like that. So I would read a lot of technical things. Uh, but even as a kid, I would read uh, books about airplanes. And, and one of my favorites was one of the series, the Life series of books. I think they became Time Life, but back then it was just Life. And there was one about flight and one about um, uh, space. And so those were well-thumbed and, and pages kind of, you know, loose and things like that because I'd read them so many times. And so I remember those those books fondly. Mm. When was that, like? Oh, that was probably that? like 19, you know, 67, 68. So I was mm. like 7, 8 years old. Wow. That, that you know, kind of 7 to 11 kind of age range. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, is there a certain time in your life where you think you came of age? Was it later or earlier? I was definitely more of a late bloomer. Uh, you know, uh, I was always the youngest kid in my class. My, my birthday's in August, so being properly Chinese, my mother thought it would be good to start school early rather than later. And, uh, and so because of that, I was also the smallest kid mm -hmm. always in my classes, you know. And so, um, you know, especially in the 60s, that was not easy because I was the only kid that looked different in my school. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that wasn't always an easy time for me. But um, so I was definitely more of a late bloomer. In fact, uh, I would say probably didn't really bloom until I got to graduate school yeah, after mm -hmm. I finished my undergraduate degree. So when, when you went to college, how did you decide where to go? Uh, you know, I wanted to study um, engineering, and uh, we were living in California, and uh, Berkeley was right there, and it was an excellent, it is an excellent engineering school, and so that was my first choice, was to go go there. Um, I applied to a number of different schools as well, I mean, all the, all the University of California's and a few others, um, but when I was accepted by Berkeley, I decided to go there. Mm -hmm. How far away was that from your home, and did you? Visit oh, not there? very far. It was about thirty-five miles. But I, I lived on campus. I lived in. A, I rushed a fraternity. I lived in a fraternity. Yeah. Was that a new, exciting experience? It was. Yeah, it was a new and exciting experience. <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, certainly, certainly living with well, how many of us were there at the time? Probably about thirty of us. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely different than living at home. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So during your undergrad, what most excited and worried you, and how did you kind of spend your time? Well, I think that freedom was exciting, you know, living away from home for the first time and, and uh, making my own decisions and doing things. But at the same time, it was a little terrifying because... Uh, actually, you know, university turned out to be a lot harder than high school. <laughs> and so I was kind of shocked when I first got there because I was working harder, studying harder than I ever had, and I was getting starting to get bad grades for the first time in my life. You know, I got a C in physics my first quarter, which was shocking because, you know, the, the science and, the, and, and math courses were always what I was strong in in school. You know, so, uh, of course, now I was being uh, around a lot of very smart kids, and uh, so I had to kind of up my game, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you feel like people knew you well as a person there? Did you feel comfortable there socially? Uh, yes and no. I think it's kind of a hard to answer because I think you're developing. I was certainly developing as a person. So, you know, I developed for, uh, especially being a late bloomer, I think. Uh, but, um, yeah, people, I mean, you know, I had a few close friends, mostly fellow engineering students. Uh, we're trying to, trying to all get through our courses and uh, do our problem sets and exams and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is right when you submitted your application, right? Was no, I, I actually submitted my first application in graduate school. Okay. And so I knew I had, hadn't quite met all the requirements because there's a whole scale of how many degrees you have and then how many years of work experience and then kind of balance that. And, and I didn't quite meet the requirements. And so I knew I was early in applying, but I put an application in anyway. And uh, that was actually, I had the application and had a, you know, was working on it uh, when the, the uh, Challenger accident happened back in 1986. And so 
Um, I actually submitted my application right after the accident, you know, because I had, hadn't quite finished it yet. But it didn't deter me from, from turning it in. So that application was not successful because I had not, you know, fulfilled the requirements. So I got a nice letter back saying, well, you don't quite qualify yet, so apply again when you do qualify. But at least I wanted to get myself on their radar. Mm -hmm. So when, um, when you went to grad school, was that something you planned to do? For a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I had uh, actually applied to work after uh, for jobs after uh, while I was getting my undergraduate degree, and I did have a couple of job offers. But then my father convinced me to go to grad school. He said, "Look, if you don't go now, you're you need to get out and start making money. You're going to get comfortable, and you're never going to go." So uh, he kind of convinced me to go, and that was the right decision. I went down to Santa Barbara and got my doctorates in chemical engineering and, and uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, that really set me up, I think, that qualified me even more to, to apply to NASA later. So this whole time, like through middle school and high school and college, was that always on your mind or did it come and go in waves? Or? It was always in the back of my mind, you know. I mean, even when I was studying uh, my, for my degrees, I would kept coming back to, well, what do I want to do with these degrees? And, uh, you know, I, I thought about some career paths that would be interesting. Uh, but ultimately, I said, you know, ultimately, I, I do still want to apply to NASA and, and hope that works out. Did the reason or motivation for it change over time as you got to know, as you just matured and got to know? Uh, I, don't think that, I don't think it changed. You know, I, I always wanted to, uh, to experience flying into space and being part of a crew that, that did things like that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, I was very realistic about the opportunities. You know, there's so many qualified applicants and, and so few positions that I knew that just from the numbers game that it was, you know, it would be, uh, uh, you know, a challenge to, to actually be one of the ones getting selected. So, so yeah. So where were you when you first got the news, and what was going through your head when you got the news? Yeah, so it was very exciting because I put my application in uh, around February of 1989, and then in the middle of the summer, I got a call from NASA, and they said, well, you know, you, you checked on one of the boxes that you didn't want us to contact your current employer, but we really want to. Can we do that? I said, yeah, you can. And so they called my boss and wanted to know what kind of person I was and all that, you know. And so that was interesting. And then in September, they called me at home and asked me if I would come to Houston to interview. So that was really exciting, you know. And so I came out and spent a week out here and interviewed. It was mostly a medical exam. And then, uh, let's see, in January of 90 is when we got the phone call um, inviting me to, to join the next class. And so that was a, a really good day, you know. <laughs> uh, very exciting. It was very early in the morning because it was probably about... 9 a.m. here in Houston, or maybe even earlier, maybe 8.30 or so. And so I was living in California, so it was two hours earlier. So they woke me up, you know, whoever called, mm -hmm. the, the head of the uh, uh, selection committee called me and, and, uh, and talked to me for a moment and then asked me if I'd like to join this class. And I said, of course, yes, of course I would like to. And, and so it was very exciting, uh, very, you know, kind of one of those, uh, you know, wanted to make sure I was really awake. <laughs> mm -hmm. what, who was the first people you told? Uh, let's see, I think I, I think I called my parents, you know, because uh, they were uh, already, I knew they were already awake, and then, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> went to work, told, told my friends, called my, my sisters, and yeah, so. All that day, that same day? Yep, yeah, all on the same mm -hmm. day, yeah. Wow. Um, so how soon after that did you move to Houston? So I moved to Houston in, uh, let's see, I think it was the end of July, or end of June, end of June. And, um, yeah, so I had about six months to kind of wrap up my job and, and sell my house, and, or not sell my house, but at least find a place to live down here and buy a house and then uh, move everything down here and get set up, yeah. So was that your first time being that far from your family? Uh, I guess so. I mean, I was in grad school, which is Santa Barbara, you know, so from Northern California to Santa Barbara is, uh, what, about close to 300 miles, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. but just a little farther, but that's okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. But actually, even as an undergrad, though, I had... Uh, Spent uh, five months, I think, doing a co-op job in Vermont, Burlington, Vermont. So I was pretty far away then. Okay. Yeah. So going back to how you were saying you <clears throat> kind of bloomed in grad school, what, mm -hmm. um, what was that process like, and how do you think you grew, and what made you more comfortable? Just being uh, I think it's, um, I think part of it was, you know, kind of getting, getting a little older and having finished my bachelor's degree. Um, going coming from Berkeley, which, like I said, in the early days, in the early years, beat me up pretty badly. Um, coming down to Santa Barbara, I, I was more of a big fish in a small pond, 
And so I think that gave me more confidence. And I think that really was the key to blossoming is, is having that more of that self-confidence. And so I think that helped me in, in all ways. And um, uh, yeah, so I think that, that kind of, uh, that process was what, what led to blooming uh, in graduate school. Okay. Um, so when you came to Houston, did you find a, kind of like a community here? And how was, what do you think of the city? Yeah, so I came to Houston, and of course the weather was uh, pretty stifling, you know, coming from Northern California to, to the uh, summer heat and humidity here. Uh, but, uh, but I liked it because uh, the people I was with, you know, my classmates, we all kind of came from different parts of the country. So we kind of had a built-in community to begin with. Uh, after moving here, and uh, people here were very friendly. Actually, they're much friendlier than, than they are in the San Francisco area. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the, kind of that southern hospitality thing. And uh, so I really enjoyed it from the beginning. The only thing that was tough was uh, how absolutely flat everything was and, and the heat and the humidity of the summer. But, uh, but I got used to those two. So did your class spend, like, a lot of time together from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did in the first year. First year we were all together doing everything together, you know, classes together, training sessions, going on field trips to the different centers and different uh, contractors that were building components for space station and space shuttle. And uh, so, yeah, we, we got to be very close. Yeah. So did you get to know each other, like, on a personal level and you knew... Did, did oh, yeah, gossip? very much so. Did you have very much so, yeah. Drama? Yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of drama, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, not a lot of drama, but, mm -hmm. but it was all good, yeah. That's great. <clears throat> um, so at what point did you learn to speak Russian? Oh, that was part of my training for the space station. So once you get, uh, once you accept an assignment to go uh, work on the space station, back then you would start immediately in intensive language training. Nowadays, uh, all the astronauts begin learning Russian when they, when they come in because we're heavily into the space station program. But back then, and we were still, you know, still fairly new, and so you didn't have to learn Russian <clears throat> unless you were assigned to a space station mm -hmm. mission. So that began right away. So having looked forward <coughs> to this job since mm -hmm. you were eight, yeah. did, did anything surprise you or catch you off guard? Uh, yeah, it caught me a little bit off guard. Uh, some of the things, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, you know, you have this idea that a group of people like astronauts are kind of different than other groups of people. And, and so, in some ways we are, but <clears throat> in other ways we're very much like any other group of people. You know, so you have some people with big egos, some people that are, you know, very humble. You have some people, well, everyone's pretty capable, you know, but you have some people that are much more op what I call operationally driven than others who are kind of more pure scientists, you know. And so it's, it's uh, you have to have kind of a balance of all that, I think, to be the most effective. But it was interesting that you... Uh, you know, in, in a spectrum of about 100 people, you still get that distribution, whereas I think the public kind of has this idea, and I did coming in, that we were mm -hmm. all one very tight group and we were all kind of the same up on this side of the, the curve. Mm -hmm. But in fact, we're all spread out. What was the most challenging thing or situation that you have faced while doing your job? I think uh, at NASA, you know, dealing with the bureaucracy is pretty tough. Uh, NASA has become, and, and I think all big organizations are, tend to go this way, they tend to become more and more bureaucratic and less efficient. Um, there are competing uh, little fiefdoms that pop up that fight each other, you know, not necessarily for the common good, and it, it can get pretty tiring. You know, you spend a lot of energy and time going to meetings and, and doing things that you don't feel are very productive, and, you know, you, you get the sense of, of uh, you're fighting the system all the time. Um, being an astronaut was also uh, an interesting position because we're, in the public, we're held up pretty high, and even within the agency, but at the same time, uh, you're also a target for a lot of people in the agency. You know, they kind of resent you. And it's, it's, a weird, it's a weird mix of kind of a love-hate thing of, of some of the people in the agency. Wow. Um, were, you, <clears throat> were you the only, like, a son of immigrants or... Um, Chinese person among your class, and was that in your, how much was that in your mind, or how much did it? Affect yeah, I mean, there weren't many Asian American astronauts, especially back then. Uh, there had been Ellison Onizuka, who was uh, a Japanese American, he, of course, unfortunately was killed on the Challenger accident. Um, before me, Franklin Chang Diaz had joined the Corps. He was one quarter Chinese and three quarters Costa Rican, and so I was the, I guess I was kind of the first full heritage Chinese-American astronaut. 
And so I was aware of that, but it doesn't didn't um, you know it wasn't something I thought about every day. But I was I was aware of of that. But I was certainly not the only son of or you know uh, child of immigrants that were in the core. Um, let's see, Jose. Um, let's see who came in a few years after me. Uh, his story is very interesting. He is he's the son of, of migrant farm workers in California. You know, I mean, what what a story he came up through the national lab like I did, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And he came in a few years after I did. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. So um, do you just have any most prevalent or most exciting memories from that time? Any stories? Yeah, I mean, I think the most exciting is, is probably the first time I got to launch into space. And uh, it was so exciting because it was uh, we were flying on the 25th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission, you know, so our our mission encompassed the entire Apollo 11 mission, and which is kind of neat because so many of us, including me, were inspired by that flight, mm -hmm. and it's kind of interesting now we're looking back at 50 years because it was 25th anniversary, now it's 50 years, it's 25 years after that, but you know, getting to fly during that time and having dreamed about it for so long and, and worked so hard and jumped through so many hoops and then gotten a couple of lucky breaks and, and had gotten into the program. Uh, getting into the rocket for the first time <clears throat> uh, to launch and then getting up into space and, and you know, realizing that goal was uh, much more of an emotional experience than I expected. Mm -hmm. You know, that and then looking back at the Earth, it was so beautiful and colorful and bright and, um, you know, that was probably the, the best moment. Mm -hmm. How long, <clears throat> like, for each, for each trip, how long did you stay? Yeah, so shuttle missions were about 10 to 14 days in duration, mm -hmm. and so I flew three shuttle missions before my station flight, so I'd accumulated somewhere, I think, around 33-ish kind of days in space, mm -hmm. and then the, the shuttle, the station mission was six and a half months, so that flight was 193 days, okay. and so the bulk of my time in space was on my fourth flight. Okay. And then <clears throat> right before that is when you got married, right? Yeah, I got married a year before I launched to the station. Okay. Yeah. How yeah. did you meet your wife? So we were set up on a blind date. <laughs> <laughs> One of my classmates, uh, my astronaut classmates, his wife, um, you know, she was uh, she worked as a nurse in a dermatology clinic, and and uh, my future wife came in one day and. And they hit it off, and she said, I've got some guy you've got to meet. And I, yeah, right, okay. And she called me and said, I've got someone you got to meet. I, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, but then it worked out. You know? <laughs> so it was kind of one of those funny blind dates that worked out. <laughs> Did you know you wanted to get married at that point? Or? You know, it's interesting. I was uh, pretty much a confirmed bachelor's throughout my 20s and 30s. And, and once I got into my 40s, uh, you know, my perspective changed a little bit. And, and I thought, wow. You know, I, I actually want to have a family. I want to have kids and have a family. And uh, so at that point, um, uh, you know, I became more serious about, about uh, you know, about that. And so then once I met the person that felt right, then, then uh, you know, we ended up getting married. And we have 12-year-old twins now, so. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay. So, um, that was what year? Sorry, two thousand three. We got married. Two thousand three. Yeah. Okay, and then your last um, expedition was two thousand four. Yeah, October of four to April of five. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so was that different that time since you were married? Or? Very much so. I mean, you know, being flying as a single guy, uh, you know, I had girlfriends, but I mean, it was uh, very different than mm -hmm. actually having uh, a wife at home, and we didn't have kids, of course, uh, not yet, and. Uh, uh, but uh, having someone that was really worried about you, well, not that my girlfriends didn't worry about me, but, but you know, it, it was a little bit different, mm -hmm. yeah. Are you allowed to wear your wedding ring into space? You are, yeah. You are? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Um, so as long I as it's not sharp. Yeah. Because yeah. it has to go into the glove. Yeah. <laughs> no tears. You don't, want to care, you don't want to cut the glove up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and then this mission... You decided to carry a Chinese flag on, right? Mm -hmm. So why, right. why did you make that decision? Well, on my first flight, I wanted to carry, uh, let's see, I wanted to carry something from the, the places where there were major, you know, Chinese populations. So uh, I carried a, a, a small flag from China. Um, I carried a, um, a, a rock carving of the symbol of Hong Kong from Hong Kong. And then I wanted to carry a Confucian scroll for, for Taiwan. And so there were some political issues going on because the State yeah. Department has to approve all these things. And so um, the scroll actually flew kind of informally in what's called a crew support locker. 
And so it was not on the official manifest because of the sensitivity of China and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, so I, I thought I, I really wanted to kind of, you know, um, because I was the first, you know, full heritage Chinese American astronaut, I wanted to kind of, you know, <clears throat> represent the major mm -hmm. population centers, Chinese people. Mm -hmm. Did you talk to your parents about that? Oh, uh, I don't think I really did. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, <clears throat> I think I just kind of did it. <laughs> Uh, did you, like, receive any feedback or anything from Chinese Americans? Oh, yes. Uh, you know, I, I received, well, actually, the biggest um, uh, biggest feedback I got was from Hong Kong. They were very thrilled about the whole thing. And back then, the, the governor of Hong Kong was Chris Patton. That was back in 1994, 1995, before it reverted back to China. And so he arranged for me to, to come and visit Hong Kong and go on a whole tour through Hong Kong and, and talk to universities and schools and things like that after my flight. Yeah. Uh, Ch uh, Taiwan didn't really have much of a response because they were not supposed to. I guess they were told not to uh, by the U.S. And China was, I don't know what China was. China was kind of, they seemed almost indifferent at the time. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of weird. <laughs> Probably because they were working on their own astronaut program. Uh -huh. They didn't really want to play me up. <laughs> so with all these political things being so like inextricable with with your job, basically, was that mm -hmm. how much was that present in your mind? Uh, it was present, but I didn't worry about it too much. But uh, certainly NASA and the, and the uh, uh, State Department did. So whenever I would be invited to China while well, well, I was a NASA employee, I was not allowed to go because they'd say, well, we don't want to get Taiwan upset. And then every time Taiwan invited me, they said, well, you can't go because we don't want to upset China. So I think it was just easy for them. They were just being lazy. They didn't really want to work on it. It was easy to say no. Wow. <laughs> so was that personal for you at all? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I thought it was unfair and, and foolish, frankly. I thought it would have been good. Uh, public relations and, and, you know, things like that. But um, it wasn't my decision, so I never got over to uh, China and again. I, I actually went to China before I joined NASA in 88 for the first time, and I never got back there until 2006 after I'd left NASA already. What kinds of things did you do over there? Uh, you know, I was, in, I was part of an organization that was kind of promoting some of the uh, like education programs in space and, and, you know, using space as kind of the hook. And so I participated in some of those events, talking to Chinese school children, things like that. And then I met some of the Chinese space officials and was invited to visit the Astronaut Center of China in 2006. And in fact, I was the first American to go visit their center, and I got to meet their astronauts, including their first astronaut and, and a few others, and kept in touch over the years, met several other uh, important um, you know, leaders of their space program as well as other astronauts. And so we've kind of kept in touch, although these days it's a little more difficult uh, mm -hmm. with, the, with the current government. I think everyone's a little bit nervous over there about um, you know, having too many foreign contacts. So it's kind of a, a strange time, I think, for China right now. So has that been a big focus of your work since, since leaving being an astronaut? Is kind of representing those conversations, or uh, I wouldn't say a big part, but it's been something that's important to me, and, and I try to do you know small, uh, in my own small way, I guess I try to help contribute to, uh, you know, trying to bring our countries together, you know, bring the U.S. and China together. The um, I'm a member of the Committee of 100, which is a group of prominent Chinese Americans. It was started by I.M. Pei and Yo-Yo Ma back in you know, around 1990 after the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989 and trying to promote more communication and understanding and, and kind of be a bridge, you know. And so I've tried to do that through the space space part, and I've been an advocate for working together in space because looking at our example of working with Russia in space, I think that's really bettered our relationship overall. Mm -hmm. Even though our relations aren't great now, I would I would argue they'd be a lot worse if we weren't working on the station together. So, what is uh, <clears throat> some of the work you've done since being an astronaut, or to this day? Uh, you mean uh, just just worked uh, yeah. supporting myself? We yeah. So I kind of work for myself. <laughs> you know, I kind of do a few different things. I do a little consulting work for some of the space companies. Uh, I do some speaking, public speaking. In fact, mm -hmm. I have my own company now for the last few years called One Orbit, and we do corporate events, and we also do sponsored education events. Uh, I teach part-time here at Rice, you know, as a, a part-time lecturer in mechanical engineering. I help out with some of the, the lab courses and also have a, um, have a uh, graduate um, 
space course on, on design for the space environment. So uh, really it's enjoyable to come out and interact with, with students, the young people. And uh, they pay me a little bit, you know, I can, about enough to buy a parking pass. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're, when your children were born, um, what was that like and how did it change your life? That was huge. Uh, you know, it was kind of interesting because I, I have two nieces who are older now. Uh, but when they were born, that was quite exciting, my older sister's children. And, uh, you know, being an uncle was, was great. But uh, I didn't expect how different it would be when I had my own kids. And so when my kids were born, and it might surprise you to hear this, but uh, it was more fundamentally life-changing and, and significant to me than even flying into space. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's been great, yeah. Um, as they've grown older, how do you think they, like, how do you think their life and their being raised has been different from when you were a child, whether by the mm -hmm. values or beliefs you've raised them with or just the social world around them? Uh, no, I think, I think it's, they have come up in a different environment for sure. Uh, I don't think, I think the values are the same. I think uh, my wife and I agree we instill the same values in them of, of being a good person. You know, I think that kind of sums it up of integrity and honesty mm -hmm. and and uh, working hard and the importance of doing the right thing, you know, things like that. And so uh, I'm very proud of who they are as young people, and I think they'll stay on that path. It's very different in that my father especially was very strict, you know, and, and uh, the answer to everything I wanted was no, you know, automatically no. <laughs> and, uh, you know, every now and then I would be able to talk him around, but, uh, but not very often. Whereas in, in a way, I probably, I'm sure I do, I'm sure I overcompensate a little and I say yes uh, almost all the time to my kids. But at the same time, uh, like I said, they're, they're growing up to be very, very nice young people. And so, uh, I, you know, I don't feel too bad about that. Mm. <laughs> um. You said they're 12 years old? Yes. Right. Okay. What are they starting to become interested in? Well, my son, Henry, ever since he was very young, like two years old, he decided he wanted to be a doctor. He was fascinated by the way, you know, living things work and organs and uh, always asking questions. And then he got fascinated by the brain. Well, how does the brain work? You know, so ever since very young age, he wanted to be a, a brain surgeon. So he's still on that path. Uh, he wants to be a neurosurgeon. He's uh, one of my good friends is chief of surgery at Henry Ford Health Systems in Detroit. And so, you know, he would come and visit and bring him some few things and tell him some things and so encourage him along. So he's very much still going down that path. My daughter, she's not sure. Caroline says she wants to be an engineer, but I think maybe that's mostly because I'm an engineer. But, but she does like building things um, from a young age. She's uh, uh, always enjoyed, you know, uh, kind of being very creative. Uh, she also has a very artistic side, though, and so, you know, um, not that that's not compatible with engineering, but uh, but I'm not sure what she wants to do. She's, she says she, she's she's still working on it. And they're 12. Yeah, they're 12. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, something, I had another question about your kids, I think. Do you have anything there? Um... <laughs> I guess, how has fatherhood changed your perspective on life and on things in general? Yeah, so it's, uh, of course, it's a big responsibility being a parent. Uh, it's interesting, though, being a father, you know, it's, um, so I'm kind of, I guess I'm a little bit more big picture, you know, whereas my wife is more kind of the day-to-day -day and, and I mean, she, not that she's not strategic, because she is. She's, she's got it all planned out where they're going to go to school and all the activities you're going to have and all the camps you're going to go to and things like that. But, uh, um, but I, f I feel the responsibility. Well, we both do. We both feel the responsibility of caring for young people and trying to bring them up in a, in a good way and, and have them you know, become productive uh, members of society. Sounds a bit like a cliche, but it's kind of true. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, do they think it's a big deal that you were an astronaut? Well, it's astronaut? kind of funny. When they were little, I mean, of course, I have many astronaut friends, so uh, they were used to other people having astronaut dads, you know, and, and so <laughs> it didn't seem like that big a deal until they started going to school, and then they figured out that, uh, well, oh, I guess mm -hmm. not everyone's dad <laughs> is an astronaut. You know? yeah. So, um, but it's, uh, you know, it's okay. Yeah, I don't think it's, yeah. So are those a lot of your family friends? Do you guys still spend time together a lot? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of them, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. A lot have, have moved away, but, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but if we still see them now and then, yeah. Um, what are your hopes for the future just in your own life? Uh, gosh, in my own life. So I, I kind of see my post-NASA career life as 
as kind of bringing my, my kids along and, and helping them, you know. And so I'm um, still working pretty hard because i got these two kids to support and put through college and actually put through the schools they're in now. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, so I want to be able to uh, make sure that they get the opportunities to, to go and thrive and, and start their own lives. And, and that's one thing. People often ask me, well, are they going to be astronauts? And I said, well, only if they want to be. I'm, I'm not pushing them to do that. You know, I want them to find their own path. And in the case of Henry, he already knows what he wants to be, so that's great. But, uh, you know, Caroline, will I'll let her kind of find her way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Do you guys have relationships with, like, your extended family do you see them a lot? Uh, my, my family lives in California, so we see them maybe, uh, you know, once or twice uh, a year, so not that often. My wife's family's kind of scattered around, so we see them intermittently as well. So not really, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so unfortunately we're kind of isolated here in, mm -hmm. in Houston. But being in the middle of the country, it's, it's easy to get to either coast or to different places. So it's, it's not too bad. And then you said you've kind of taught them Chinese, right? Yes, yeah, so they've learned Chinese uh, from a young age. Okay. We had a Chinese nanny, and so they were grew up bilingual in their early years, and uh, they don't really want to speak Chinese, so, <laughs> so I think they've forgotten a lot, but it's still in there. And uh, they took some Chinese in an after-school program that my wife started at their school. And um, then... Um, but it's still in there because I, I know that uh, when I went to college, when I went to university, I forgot a lot of my Chinese. But, but then when I went to visit China in 88, being immersed in it, a lot of it kind of came back. And so, so I'm sure that, you know, when they go to university, if they want to take some Chinese classes, that it'll come back. And if they ever go somewhere where they speak Chinese in China or, or one of the other countries, they'll, it'll, it'll come back. At what point did you decide that was important to you to teach your kids Oh, uh, right away, because uh, I saw the value of it, because not only uh, speaking another language, of course, of, you know, one of the most populous nations of the right. earth, but um, it really helped me to learn Russian, I think. I think your brain gets w wired differently when you grow up bilingual, and that way you can accept a third or more languages easily. And so learning Russian was still a big challenge for me, but I think it was easier because I was already bilingual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Do you have any other interests or hobbies, either that you've grown, you've picked up in mm -hmm. your adulthood, or that occurred? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I've always loved flying, and so, you know, that goes with my interest of airplanes when I was young. And so I learned to fly in grad school. As soon as I finished my coursework for my PhD and passed my qualifying exam, I took out a student loan, went right down to the airport, and started learning how to fly. And so I've been flying now for almost 35 years. I've still got my own little airplane. I've got a house down near NASA in a flying community, so I have a, a house with a hangar and a private runway for the community, and uh, still still get out there and fly now and then. And when I have a business trip close by to Dallas or, or San Antonio or Austin, it's easy to fly myself so rather than get on Southwest. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Anything else? Any other books or music or sports? Uh, let's see. So, yeah, I, I like skiing. I haven't been skiing in a few years. And in fact, the last time was when I, I we, we ran into your family in Deer yeah. Valley. You know, I think that was 2014. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I still enjoy skiing. I'll have to get back out there. I've uh, just been kind of busy. But um, let's see. What else? Um, yeah, I guess that's that's about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. Do you have any hopes or worries or fears for just the future of America in general or maybe the international, in the yeah. world? Been? Yeah, I think, you know, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to see America become complacent, especially in places like, in areas like space exploration. I'm glad to see that we're trying to do more. And actually, I'm very glad to see there are companies and people like Elon Musk and SpaceX and Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin who are, you know, commercially trying to go build a space infrastructure and to explore, you know, and so I think that's very exciting. In fact, um, I would bet that SpaceX gets to Mars before NASA, unless they partner together, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, I've met Elon Musk a few times. I do some consulting for SpaceX and, and uh, you know, people have counted him out on so many things. And he keeps coming and, and achieving those things. Much takes much more time than he estimates, but but he ends up getting there. And so, um, yeah, I, I think he'll definitely get to Mars. You know, but it won't be as quickly as he says. Mm -hmm. But uh, he'll get to Mars with or without NASA. 
But I think it would benefit to do a partnership because NASA has a lot of know-how, a lot of experience that can and should be drawn upon, mm -hmm. and resources. What do you think humans will will do on Mars or do with Mars? Uh, you know, it's hard to say, uh, you know, because we don't really know what's going to come out of the exploration. I mean, I think that one of the most significant things that could come out is possibly uh, astronauts could possibly find, you know, positive evidence of maybe past life on Mars. You know, maybe just microbial life. But because there's been some evidence from some of the, ast you know, some of the, um, uh, you know, asteroids that we think might have come from Mars that they indicate there could have been some kind of forms of life. And there's been an argument, scientific argument back and forth on that. Uh, there, you know, the, earlier this year, the Curiosity rover found trapped methane in the sedimentary rocks which could indicate that there was some kind of life process going on that created that methane and it got trapped in the sedimentary layers. And so if uh, astronauts go there someday and actually find some kind of fossil, you know, of some simple life form, I mean, I think that would just really change the world, change our world. You know, the fact that we found positive evidence of life elsewhere in the universe, in fact, in our own backyard, mm -hmm. which would suggest there's life all over the universe, which I believe, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wow. So, if your um, future great grandchildren were to watch this, mm -hmm. what advice would you have for them, or just to f the future generations in general? Yeah, I think it's important to be proactive to, in your life. You know, figure out. I mean, find your passion, figure out what you want to do, and try to guide your life in that direction. You know, plan a path and have the courage to take that path. Um, you know, too too often I think people just kind of bumble around and you know, kind of see what happens and where I end up. And, you know, to me, it's important to try to guide your life to, to go where you think you want to go. And, you know, you'll probably end up somewhere else. <laughs> but, but I think it's important to try to do that, you know. And so uh, that and, and being true to yourself, you know, being a good person, doing the right thing, uh, being true to yourself, uh, making sure you take some time out for yourself to, you know, your happiness is important too, you know. I mean, it's important to help others and serve others, but but you have to help yourself as well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all a balance. It really is a balance. Um, oh, I was curious about, this is kind of out of order of chronology, but uh, in 2004, we like read all the, your Wikipedia page. And stuff, oh, you did? Okay. It talked, about, <laughs> um, it talked about how you got to vote for the first time, yes, the right. first American to vote in space. Uh, vote and, for president. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah, first American to vote for president okay. from space. Um, yeah. Yeah, how big of a deal was that for you? Uh, it was kind of a big deal. I mean, I had literally hadn't thought about it because we were going to leave for, for Russia, um, you know, in, in August before the election, and I hadn't thought to put in for an absentee ballot. And so there was no way for me to vote unless, you know. And so fortunately, one of my classmates had voted in a local election from space before, and so the mechanism was kind of set up, and they just had to adapt that for a federal, you know, a presidential election. And so... Um, so fortunately, they were able to do that, and, uh, and, and we were able to publicize that to try to encourage people to go out and vote. Yeah. Hmm. Did so. that change the way you look at elections now, or was it kind of a routine? No, thing? not really. I mean, I've, you know, I've voted in, in, I haven't voted in every single election. I've voted in every presidential election, but mm -hmm. not every single local election. You know? but, uh, but I think it's important to go out and exercise your rights if you, if you have a, you know, an opinion on who, do you, who you want to win, and, and hopefully you do. But... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it was it was nice to set an example for other people on the earth that they should, you know, think about think about getting out there and voting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what are you most grateful for? I'm most grateful for the opportunities I've had. You know, my father has said many times as an immigrant, he said, you know what? Uh, and my mother's the one that had the insight on this because when they were young people in Taiwan, my father was perfectly content to stay there, and my mother is the one that pushed him to come to the U.S. because she saw the opportunities here. And so my father has said many times that he's, he's grateful that uh, my mom pushed him to come here because this was the place where there would be opportunities for us, you know, especially the children. And so I'm grateful to, to have this, these opportunities. My father has always said that he owes everything uh, to this country, to, to becoming an American, and so it's very important, I think. Um, and then, do you identify particularly as American or Chinese-American? Uh, very much as an American. I mean, I was born here. Uh, I, you know, came and, and uh, you know, was uh, took advantage of all the opportunities here 
and became who I am and, and served it as an astronaut for NASA, so I very much feel American. At the same time, I feel my Chinese heritage, and, and that's why I've been interested in trying to get uh, you know, the two countries to have better relations. And I saw spaceflight as a possible avenue for this. You know, unfortunately, when I got out of NASA, gosh, almost 14 years ago, you know, I thought, well, certainly in 10 years, relations will be better. And unfortunately, I think they're actually worse. <laughs> it's actually much worse. <laughs> so uh, that's unfortunate, but it doesn't mean we should, should stop, shouldn't stop trying. Yeah. Um, I think those are all the questions we have, but mm -hmm. do you have yeah. any, uh, any other stories or advice? Uh, gosh, I think you guys covered it. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> pretty right. comprehensive. You guys did a lot of homework. You're the most prepared <laughs> interviewers I've ever, uh, by far, by like a factor of a hundred. You know. In fact, oh, the yeah. interview I just came from, uh, remind me again how many missions you flew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was actually one question they wanted us to ask was like, what kind of demands are there on your time and your schedule from just the fact of being an astronaut? You mean today, like now, yeah, present day? Thing, or, yeah, you constantly invited uh, to things. And yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I get uh, requests to do a lot of different things, and, um, you know, it's uh, it's kind of a, another thing. It's a balance, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I get to do some pretty cool things. Uh, last week, about a week ago, was part of a big opening for Mont Blanc, you know, the pen and watch company. They uh, mm -hmm. uh, unveiled a new pen called the Star Walker out in the Flight Museum down here. And I was part of that and had several movie stars there, Hugh Jackman, you know, the Wolverine. My kids were pretty excited that I got to meet the Wolverine, you know, and, <laughs> and Charles Melton, and, you know, so it's kind of fun. Okay. All right, well, thank you so thank much. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, you guys.